All right, so I wanted to cover um, cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. They're kind of used interchangeably. So we'll kind of talk about that as well as we go through this. So cognitive ther therapy versus cognitive behavioral therapy. There's a slight distinction. Um, cognitive therapy was created by Aaron Beck and he is basically known as the father of um, cognitive therapy. It was developed in the 1950s. A lot of um, people have added behavioral approaches and his theory kind of developed over time um, to include behavioral approaches. So it is most often called cognitive behavioral therapy and people will attribute Aaron Beck to cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's kind of important to know that there's a distinction there, but in practice, oftentimes people are just using CBT and not necessarily cognitive therapy in its truest form. The cognitive behavioral therapy is also influenced by the modalities and research and work of Albert Ellis and REBT, so rational emotive behavioral therapy. So they are very closely connected as well. So all of that is kind of important to note that these cognitive theories are really um, very similar. They have similar premises is kind of techniques might be slightly different. So the basic premise of all these cognitive theories is that how we think affects how we act and feel. So that thought is very key in the change mechanism. Here we're changing thoughts, right? Um, so if you're changing thoughts, then you change your feelings and your behavior because they're connected. Um, there. So how we feel affects what we do. What we do affects how we think and feel. That, that triad is very important in all these cognitive theories. So I'm not gonna cover Aaron Beck very much. There's a lot of information on him if you want to. There's the Beck Institute that has probably even more information. Um, but he did have some struggles with his health and his um, parents um, lost two siblings. So that may have impacted kind of them being a little bit overprotective of that and him having some anxiety um, and things as well. So he believed that he um, experienced his anxiety, but being able to talk himself through his fears was really important to him as he faced problems in life. So that's probably a big piece of how he developed in his theories as well. So I'm not gonna cover a lot of this. Him, he has written a ton of different books and um, journal articles. There's a lot of information out there on CBT because of him. Um, also his daughter, Judith Beck, is very well known as well in the psychology world. Um, she's written a lot of well-known books on cognitive therapy, particularly cognitive therapy and weight loss. Um, so she's got a lot of um, articles and books out there as well. Um, so there's variations on cognitive therapy, like I said, that have developed from Beck's work. Mostly they're called CBT, okay? So <laughs> there are different contributors that have kind of um, contributed their ideas to cognitive therapy and kind of created their own approach. Um, all of these just kind of fall under the CBT umbrella. So like I said, it's very confusing at times. Um, cognitive therapy is Aaron Beck's work and his bird, a whole bunch of other things that are CBT. And so a lot of people just consider him the father of CBT as well, even though that it's not technically true. It has a neutral position of human nature. Um, it talks a lot about that internal communication or self-talk, our thought patterns, our metacognition, um, and that that is accessible through our self-reflection, our introspection. So we are gonna metacognate in this theory, right? We're gonna think about our thinking. Um, clients' beliefs have highly personal meanings. Um, meanings can be discovered through the client rather than be taught by the therapist. So um, understanding clients' meanings of their thoughts is important and having the client interpret those is important to CBT. Um, REBT is a little bit different. They categorize irrational thought patterns. Right? It doesn't necessarily um, delve into what the, the core meaning of that thought is or core belief, right? Um, so life events can trigger automatic maladaptive thoughts and cause you kind of more dysfunctional patterns of thoughts. These maladaptive thoughts are extreme in nature and distort reality. Um, maladaptive thoughts stem from maladaptive core beliefs. So again, that's a big piece of the series, looking into those core beliefs and where they came from and then shifting them. Core beliefs often come from childhood events. Core beliefs parallel closely to the idea of Adler's lifestyle and kind of those early life events that cause lifestyles that are not as healthy, right? So the view of this is very constructive as approach, right? We're creating our own reality, creating our own meanings. Um, it's pragmatic um, through discourse of others, through learning from others, we are changing how we think and act and feel. 
Um, it's anti-deterministic, which means we can change, right? It's active, educative, it's got an empirical support behind it. People change given tools that they're, or tools or new skills. So that's important there that we're teaching them things and we're giving them new skill sets through um, therapy. Um, the yeah, this stress model is important. That's basically that there are multiple factors that influence who we become. There's genetic predispositions, biological factors, and then our early learning experiences and our experiences throughout life that impact um, how we think and behave. Um, they produce specific cognitive schemas um, and core beliefs, the way we, the patterns of thinking that we live through. Um, they may lay dormant until conditions are opposing on a person. So that's basically the idea that we may be functioning fairly well until a big stressor comes into our life. And then these core beliefs, these cognitive schemas may be more impactful. They may come out more and then you may have dysfunctional ways of being in the world uh, when you're in that stressful situation. Schemas and core beliefs lend direction towards how one feels and behaves. Most individuals are not aware of their core beliefs um, that we create intermediate beliefs, which set our attitudes and our rules through life. And those are the assumptions that we live by and they are reflective of our core beliefs. So we can like our self-talk is oftentimes an intermediate belief, but not necessarily a core belief. We're not always aware of the core beliefs. Um, so all of this is hinted at by our automatic thoughts, those automatic things that pop into our head. Um, so again, we're lo looking at different levels of thoughts. Core beliefs are deep core, value belief sort of things and there's intermediate thoughts that are rules expectations that we live by kind of that lifestyle piece that Adler and they talked about it was similar to Adler and then our automatic thoughts are those things that oh, just pop in immediately after an event happens or things are said or whatever we have an automatic thought so we the focus on the past is minimal the only time that the counselor would focus on the client's past would be when the client has a very strong desire or need to do so so you would um Help them with that. And then the current focus produces little change. They may not need to go back to the past to understand more of those core beliefs. Um, when examining the past, it's important to ever uncover the origins of the dysfunctional thinking. The overall goal um, is to change thinking that affects attitudes, feelings, and behaviors um, and help them learn how to change those cognitions. So it's teaching them the model, teaching them how to change thoughts that aren't functioning well for them in their life and helping them to have better thought patterns that lead to more functioning and more meaningful life for the client. <clears throat> so Beck's cognitive triad is important. These are kind of where our thoughts lie, our automatic thoughts are about our, ourselves, the self. Um, and these are the dysfunctional ones here that um, cause problems and dysfunction in people. Um, so the self, um, dysfunction with the self is worthless. We're worthless is an automatic thought that can um, cause a lot of dysfunction. The world is unfair, right? And then the other one is about others that the, the future is hopeless. So we have self, others, or the world, and then our future. Um, clients begin to think about feelings as tangible exterior things, and then we can change them, right? So we can behave better once we are not internalizing these thoughts as truths of ourselves in the world. So cognitive behavior therapy versus reactional emotive behavioral therapy, or RBT, they're very similar in some ways. That, that cognitive triangle is definitely there about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors all impacting each other. Um, CBT thoughts are labeled as dysfunctional, whereas in REBT, you're going to call them irrational. So you have dysfunctional thoughts, then you have irrational thoughts. CBT therapists are more collaborative, right? We're looking at client meanings of some core beliefs. We're looking at collaborating with those. An REPT therapist is more confrontational and more seen as an expert on irrational thoughts, right? And what thought patterns are, are healthy. So they, they determine rational and irrational and kind of are the experts on that. Whereas a, um, a CBT therapist is more collaborative and it helps the client identify their own personal meaning and their own personal core values and beliefs that it would help them be more functional. Typically, REBT is more aggressive and confrontational. And that is primarily because Ellis presents it that way. Um, CBT is less aggressive because Beck was a less aggressive person as well. So that might, I, I think that has some things to do a lot with the counselor's personality and that you may be able to shift those um, according to your personality, make the model fit you as well. Um, the cognitive model 
is um, basically people are responding to cognitive representations. Our perceptions are everything, right? It's not the event. It's not the, the situation that's causing us distress. It is our thoughts about that event that's causing us distress. Um, so that's important in the cognitive model in both REBT and CBT. Um, core beliefs underlie how we think, feel, and behave. So the core of us, and that's oftentimes we're unaware of those core beliefs. Intermediate beliefs consist of attitudes, rules, and expectations, assumptions, which um, outgrow from our core beliefs. They're based in our core beliefs, but they're rules that we kind of live by, um, expectations that we have of the world and ourselves. Automatic thoughts result in our behaviors, feelings, and physiological responses, and they are an outgrowth of our attitudes, rules, and expectations, right? Cognitive schemas or core beliefs. This is kind of how we are our map for the world and ourselves. Um, this is structure, screening, coding, evaluating stimuli in our environment. It's how we process information and how we map it out in our brain and how we come up with a plan. Um, it is um, a master plan that turns core beliefs on and off. Core beliefs lend direction to how we think, act, and feel. Judith Beck identified three broad core beliefs, helplessness, unlovability, and worthlessness. That is that kind of uh, goes along with um, with um, Beck's uh, theory as well. Um, but the confusion over the difference between cognitive schemas and beliefs, they're very similar. Cognitive schema is more your map and it's also how you're organizing and bringing in information and evaluating information. Core beliefs are a little bit different. They're more value-based, the core beliefs of who you are in the world is. Um, so the ABC model of cognitive behavioral therapy, again, is those activating events cause these automatic beliefs, thoughts, right? Our cognitions, our thoughts about the event, and then the consequences, our feelings, our behavior, that result from that belief. And then that continues to go in a circle because then we do something oftentimes it causes another event, right? Um, so here's an example of an unhealthy thought process. So you're leaving job after having a bad day as you leave your past coworker, but they walk by and apparently ignore you. Your belief about this, your automatic thought is, they ignore me, they don't like me, feeling low, rejected. So then that results in a feeling that you're being feeling re rejected. I would put that with the C more. You go home and avoid others. So that's your consequence. You feel rejected, so then you avoid other people's. You act passive aggressively towards people at your house. Right? behaviors. Um, intermediate beliefs, uh, beliefs, rules, expectations. I kind of talked about those. Their outgrowth of core beliefs. A core belief that I am capable will lead to different attitudes and rules, expectations. So if you think I'm capable, then your expectations of yourself are going to be that you can meet challenges, that you're able to, you know, try new things, right? The assumptions that I'm powerless you lead to other things where you would not um, believe that you can make a difference or you wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to make a difference here. Why even try, right? So those different intermediate beliefs and automatic thoughts are basically a result of these core beliefs. So um, I'm powerless to change my life. Attitude, life sucks. There's little I can do about it. I expect that even if I try hard to change, it will not work out. So why bother? So that's your rules and expectations that you're living by. The assumption is there's little I can do to make life better. Um, I'm capable, core belief is I'm okay because uh, I'm sure things will work out in the end. And then your expectation is that you continue working even though they may be um, in a difficult situation. And you assume things will work out if you work hard, right? So it's just your different way of being in the world because of the core belief. Um, automatic thoughts occur when situations arise in our lives, stress, someone gets at us, it's just an automatic pop. Um, into our brain, we're thinking something. Um, based on our intermediate beliefs and related to our cognitive distortions, the way we view the world, right, which could be distorted or um, is oftentimes distorted to our own personal um, experiences. Um, it can be words that we say in our minds. It can be images that reflect a state of being. Um, they result in behaviors, feelings, and physiological responses that are gonna reinforce the way we feel and think about the world, our, our cognitive schemas or our core beliefs. Um, coping or compensatory strategies are developed to acknowledge the experience of a negative core belief or a negative feeling. Um, and it, it helps you to avoid feelings of inferiority, kind of similar to Adler's approach um, in individual psychology. 
Um, you developed in early life, these behaviors, um, and they're not adaptive over time. They don't really change. They're not, you know, so you're using behaviors that really don't fit the situation oftentimes. Um, so for example, a person who's always trying to achieve and be successful, um, but feels inadequate is gonna maybe overwork themselves. They'll work longer hours, um, trying to achieve this feeling of success, but then they're always gonna feel like they didn't do the right thing. And so they continue to overwork. <clears throat> a person always trying to control others because he or she feels powerless over time. A person has difficulty in relationships because they're still trying to control other people um, rather than um, shift their core belief um, that they have power. Logical errors. Um, um, so these are not irrational thoughts. In, in REBT, you would label them irrational. These are logical errors or errors in thinking. Um, arbitrary inferences, jumping to conclusions, um, or cognitive distortions is sometimes what they would call these as well. Jumping to conclusions, selective abstraction, which is when you're picking out just pieces of information, or I call that filtering. You're filtering. Sometimes you filter for positive, sometimes you filter for negative, right? It's just supporting that cognition, that cognitive schema, whatever supports that cognitive schema. So if you um, feel like you're a failure, that's your core belief, I'm a failure, you're only gonna see the times when you were a failure and not the times when you succeeded, right? Um, Overgeneralization is taking one small thing that's happening and generalizing it to all things. So if you get a bad score on a test or something, then you're just a failure at everything. You can't do anything right. Why even try, right? Magnification, minimization. That's you know making a mountain out of a molehill kind of thing. So if something that's small, you make it into a bigger deal than it is and your world's gonna end or something that is maybe good, you minimize it and oh, that doesn't really matter. Everybody does that. You know, not really that good at stuff. Right? You minimize the good stuff sometimes, um, depending on your cognitive schema, what your core belief is. Um, personalization takes everything personal. So if um, your boss is saying something about, you know, making sure you get out here on time, you're like, oh, that one time I was late two months ago. That's what he's talking about. It's about me. I should, right? Taking it personal and it has maybe little to do with you. Um, labeling, mislabeling. That's basically calling your safe names um, and kind of putting yourself down oftentimes is what clients are doing with labeling. I'm a failure, I'm stupid. Um, they call themselves really mean names sometimes. Polarized thinking is that black and white extreme all or nothing sort of thinking. Um, either good or bad, there's nothing in between. Um, I'm a failure, I'm a success, um, those sorts of things. Um, so these are logical errors or um, distorted thinking. Is kind of how they would put it in CBT that you'll find and help teach clients to catch and like recognize in themselves. Um, the client therapist relationships, clients are taught to be their own therapist. Basically, you're teaching them the model, the method, so that they can catch their thoughts and shift their thoughts. Um, but the therapy and homework is oftentimes used in the, the cognitive logs, having them record the activating event, their thought, their feeling, their behaviors, and then kind of going back and shifting those is oftentimes part of CBT is just logging those out and having them write their own paper. The use of Socratic dialogue enables students to find their, or enables clients to find their own answers, so you use that quite a bit. The general steps is just assessing for those irrational, maladaptive thoughts, the distorted perceptions, um, and then help them find more adaptive, rational thinking and then help them to internalize that through coping strategies or different thought patterns they can cope and practice. Um, support clients as they try these new things out, right? So they develop the skills. Um, there's a lot of techniques. We'll talk about some that are more essential, some are common. Essential ones is the Therapeutic Alliance, of course, that has found tons of research that that's very important in counseling. So it's um, the Therapeutic Alliance is formed collaboratively. You do a collaborative interview. It's a team effort to guide um, the client through this and find, find their meaning, their core beliefs, find those things that are uh, influencing them and asking them questions about the process as well. Um, you demonstrate empathy, caring, and optimism as the counselor. And you adapt your therapeutic style to the client's personality. Um, so if they're really anxious, you do a lot more listening, um, you're not as confrontational right, if they are not the kind of person that can handle that. So you shift 
to them as well. There is um, some key concepts here with our childhood impacts our core beliefs and how our cognitive schemas, right? And then our intermediate beliefs are our rules and assumptions about how to interact with the world. And then our coping strategies are also um, based on those and the situations and our automatic feelings, that's all connect, right? So that's important to understand that relationship and teach this to your clients. Um, cognitive conceptualization. Um, so you're gonna look at kind of this assessment piece of like where all of these are and how they all affect the client. So you might get some childhood information on how their core beliefs may be formed, their cognitive schema is formed. Ident accurately identify the problems that they're having, their behaviors that are not functional, their feelings that aren't functional, the thoughts that aren't functional, right? Determine that diagnosis, then identify the patterns of thoughts to shift and change. Um, identify maybe the stressor that caused these uh, um, cognitive distortions to really dysfunction, cause them to be dysfunctional at that time um, and address those. So essential. Like I said, the central is the Socratic questioning is just helping the client to think rationally. So you're asking them about their thought patterns and asking them to find evidence for the thought patterns or find a logic for the thought patterns or kind of shifting that, right? So you're challenging the thought patterns oftentimes through Socratic questioning, asking lots of questions. So they recognize that their thought is distorted and that's not logical. Um, educating the client about the model. Graphics, they use that ABC, go through there. They have blogs, right? Of how to write down your thoughts and challenge your thoughts. Discussion, explanation through that. Um, challenging that, like raise their awareness, how to catch it, how to shift it. Um, cognitive distortions, um, teaching clients about those, those thought patterns, like I said. <laughs> Overgeneralization, black and white thinking, you teach them those things so that they can identify where their, their cognitive distortion is, their thought that's not um, pragmatic for the situation. Um, <clears throat> identify intermediate beliefs um, that gets even closer to core ones. You can use worksheets to help them identify maybe what's behind their automatic thoughts and then what's behind those to get to core beliefs. So you can challenge those core beliefs. And once you can get to that, then that helps challenge all the other things coming from there. So um, you kind of work deeper and there's lots of different worksheets that you can do with them for those things. Um, homework is basically those assignments, those tasks that you have them do between sessions. Oftentimes it's those cognitive challenging logs, it's those core belief worksheets, right? So it's helping them process their, their um, cognitive distortions and their meanings in life and things like that so they can shift their own thoughts. Um, Self-rating so scale, again, that is oftentimes used for them to rate their feelings so they can track their own progress. So that's oftentimes the sub scale, the subjective units of distress scale, um, and you just have them, right? Um, I believe the ones that typically are used in CBT are one to 100. I always use one through 10 because I'm usually working with teenagers or kids, and so it's just easier for them. But you can write your scale like on a one to, one to 10 scale, one to 100, um, like how upset you are, how emotional, how anxious you are, and then they're supposed to track, you know, if they shift their thoughts, then how, how are they feeling? So they can see um, those changes. Right. So cognitive self-monitoring, emotion self-monitoring, thinking in shades of gray. So again, it's looking for that middle, especially if they're dealing with all or nothing thinking, what's the middle. Um, exploring consequences, giving up shoulds. Um, so <clears throat> oftentimes I'll look at like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Can you live through it, right? So it's that catastrophizing kind of stuff. What, what is that? Can you live through it? Yeah, you probably could. Um, giving up shoulds and shifting the language to preferred um, or stop stop yourself from name calling, labeling yourself, right? So those sorts of things. You're shifting their, their self-talk. Thought stopping, um, that again is looking at that, that, okay, that's irrational, that's not logical, right? They don't call it irrational in CBT, but that's not logical, that's not helpful, that thought is not getting me, I call myself a failure, it's not that, whoa, catch that. that, that's one of those cognitive distortions we talked about, right? So that, and then what can I do to replace it? So oftentimes you write down those automatic thoughts that are consistently problematic, so they can catch those and thought, thought, stop. Um, it's also um, having them slow down, right? That process between the thought and the reaction so that they can choose a different way. And again, and so that's, sort of model of, you know, is this thought logical? Is this thought 
pragmatic. Is it going to help me? What might I do to change my thoughts if that's necessary, right? So there's a bunch of imagery stuff as well. And that's just kind of helping them think through thoughts again, um, uh, basically looking ahead at how that's going to impact them. Um, coping images, changing image, reality test image, repeating the image, image distraction. There's a bunch of them there. Um, rational emotive role play, debating rational and emotional parts of self. That's talking about our emotions and your logical side. I say that the wise brain's in the middle, right? You take into account both emotions and logic. So it's talking about those things and role playing it out, those voices, emotional versus logical. So you can identify the cognitive distortions that are there. Um, uh, behavioral emotive techniques. There's a lot of different ones there that kind of fit in behavioral techniques and strategies from behavioral therapy that they can pull into CBT, right? And then maybe some from REBT that they pull in as well um, because it's an umbrella for both of those. So behavioral techniques, again, is scheduling activities that would be helpful for the client. So it's just giving them that homework. You need to go, you know, work out once a week or whatever. Something that they would help them feel confidence, help them build themselves um, and their feelings of worth, right? Those sorts of things that help them be healthy. Behavioral experiments is just basically assigning them to try it out. You know, try a new behavior and see how it goes. Um, so it helps them shift their thoughts as they see a new way of being actually impacts their way of thinking and feeling as well. Okay, so initially the stages of CTU, CT or cognitive therapy was just the intake evaluation. And then there was these sessions that um, you did similar things in each time um, and they're very structured. And you start the session, end the session, start the session always by like um, processing some of their homework that you assigned and things like that. And then, you know, kind of wrap up the termination. The six stages of the kind of therapy, kind of behavior, behavioral therapy um, talks about that assessment. That's your intake evaluation um, assessment of kind of their cognitive distortions. Then that second part is helping them learn the model, reconceptualizing their thinking, behaving, think, feeling patterns, teaching them the new skills of catching their thoughts and challenging their thoughts, or maybe doing some other behavior, behavioral techniques with that, teaching them how to. to do more sort of communication or something, right? The skills acquisition. Um, and then you're basically maintaining that and helping them apply that in life and going through and supporting them and making those changes in life in that fourth stage. Maintenance is similar to that where they're beginning to get more independent and able to do that more on their own. So you may at that point schedule sessions less often. And then you have the post-treatment assessment follow-up later on that kind of determines and helps them refocus if they're struggling later after um, termination. Um, so again, intake evaluation we talked about. Um, this might even be done by an intake worker because they do a lot of the assessment pieces. Um, you're gathering, presenting problem information. You're gonna do a DSM diagnosis at the beginning. Um, you're using informal and formal um, assessment instruments sometimes. And um, you're beginning to fill in that cognitive schema that they're working with. Um, like I said, these sessions are oftentimes really kind of structured. So you set the agenda, you do a mood check-in oftentimes, you review the presenting problems and set some goals, you educate client about the model, you discuss expectations and educate the client about what's going on with them, summarize and develop homework plan. And then you ask about feedback, how that session went, whether that's working for them. And these are the same, you update and mood check each time, basically, you bridge from the previous sections. So you talk about the homework, um, those sorts of things, what's happened between sessions, and you give them feedback, um, process through some things, um, learning skills or whatever you're doing for those sessions. Termination is where the client um, is basically more independent than the counselor's taking a life active role. And that's when you know the termination is near um, and that their thought patterns are shifting. We'll be looking for that. So as far as social, cultural, and spiritual considerations, um, the studies on CBT are vast. There's a lot of support for CBT, but many of those studies did not include very many minorities. So that's important to take into account. The clients of color are often misdiagnosed. That is kind of true with the DSM. So that is something to look at as well. Um, 
the internal perspective or just kind of working on internal thoughts does devalue that the context of culture oftentimes because you're not looking at external factors the power dynamics discrimination oppression those sorts of things right because you're focused on just changing an individual um, the kinds of color um, sometimes misinterpret meanings um, ascribed to client beliefs so that's important that those core beliefs and things that need to be a collaborative process um, that includes the cultural aspects of a client and helps the client have that feedback and in, input into what those mean um, those cultures or people who see forces outside themselves as shaping one's life would have difficulty with this process because it's very much you can change things um, by changing your thoughts um, it has been shown to be effective with lots of different um, treatment um, situations. So depression, anxiety in particular, OCD, um, PTSD, gambling, addictions, those sorts of things, attention, deficit disorder, hyperactivity disorder. So there's several there that is the outcome studies are um, supporting its use. Um, it is particularly am amiable to research because of the direct relationship between um, the cognitive um, piece and behavior. So you can um, measure behavior, right? And you can measure mood. Um, and so that piece is easily measurable and easily studied. There's been hundreds of studies conducted. There's been several meta-analysis meta that basically says it's effective across a lot of different um, treatments. It has good, um, strong empirical support to be used. Um, that's why oftentimes insurance companies are looking for that because that's what they want to see. Um, as far as it being more, um, Effective than other therapies, that's not necessarily been found because it's usually a control group or weightless group. So it's more effective than no treatment at all, but not necessarily more effective than another treatment, if that makes sense. Um, most therapies today have some elements of cognitive behavioral treatment approaches because um, most therapies will contain that cognitive piece. Um, the therapeutic alliance is important. Obviously, that is important across the board. There's a lot of research on that being important to the outcomes of clients' um, treatments. So that is CBT. Um, kind of wrapping it up, it is basically about your thoughts impacting the way you behave and feel. So again, it's like RBT, that perception of how we see things, our cognitive schema on how the world is, is very impactful in how we feel and how we approach the world. So shifting that cognitive schema, shifting our thought patterns can help us change our feelings and our behaviors and change to do better and feel better about life.